Lord Jesus. battle's already over. We're just rejoicing. He already overcame for me, didn't he? Oh my, we can just rest and relax that he, the mighty conqueror, already defeated our foe. And if he is in me, then greater is he that's in the world, right? So it's not me trying to overcome. It's just him yielding myself to the great overcomer that's within me. Amen? I sure appreciate the songs. I tell you, they got me so excited. I almost came out early. And I'm getting word from above. Turn on your mic. Gotcha. We're on it. God bless you all. Everybody feeling good? Yes. Happy to be a Christian. Amen. Happy to be a believer. Amen. Living in Satan's Eden. Amen. By God's grace, we're overcoming. We're thriving. We're not just barely making it. Because there's more than enough for us to overcome in this hour and in this age. Throw anything you want at her, she's going to overcome. Yes. Amen. It's exciting. Exciting time. Uh, just want to give you a greetings. Brother Chad called, and he's doing well. He misses everybody, and, uh, but we're happy that he got a chance to go away. And how many have been praying for our pastor? We sure love our pastor. We love the gift, and it sure is a blessing to us, right? And uh, wanted to let everybody know Brother Stephen Coffey will be here Wednesday. So uh, if you will, keep him in prayer and be expecting this week to hear from the Lord. Amen? I'd like you to turn in your Bibles. Please don't get upset at me. I have a lot on my heart. So I told Brother Franco, we'll just go until we run out of time and skip your lunch and go right to dinner and we'll be, we'll be all right with it. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And this may be a little bit different, but I only go by inspiration. I don't know how to do anything else. I don't know how to preach. I don't know how to present anything. I just go as I feel led, and if something blesses me, I bring it to you, because if it helped me, I believe it'll help you, right? So I want you to turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. It's Paul speaking here. It's right before he knows that his time, his course on this earth is over. He says, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. So the very thing that Paul wants you to realize is you ain't going to fight this good fight and you ain't going to run your course without faith. God has so ordained it and set it in such a way that only faith is the only way to overcome. And Paul very clearly shows this and reminds us this before he departs. I want you to also to go to Revelations chapter 3. Starting at verse 14. I'm going to read the whole portion here. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness. The beginning of the creation of God. This is God creating himself in flesh, the beginning. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot, I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Now remember, this is not the bride. He doesn't spew the bride out of his mouth. The bride is written on the palms of his hands. This is his beloved, his loved one. But this is this lukewarm age that you're living in. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest thou not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked? I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried with the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. How many appreciate that? As many as I love, I'm going to rebuke, and I'm going to chasten and spank very, very hard. I am growing to appreciate that more every day. Honing in on the next few verses. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, 
I will come into him. I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You just bow your heads in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you this morning once again needing, Lord, to hear from you. Lord, we are a needy people. We don't come in our own strength. We come humbled, Lord. Lord, the age and the life that we're living in lets us realize that you are our only source of strength. And just as you overcame, we must overcome if we're going to sit on that throne with you, Father. So, Father God, I just pray, Lord, that you would take this time, Lord, Anoint me, move me off of the side, Lord. Just take my lips. I surrender the gift. I surrender all that I am to you. Lord, speak the words of encouragement, correction, whatever we need, Lord, we want to hear from you. Lord, hold nothing back. The hour's getting late. Father, we want to give you the glory that you deserve with the life that you've given us. We love you. We commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So, in looking at this scripture, I, I want to tell you, I'll lay down the background. This is normally how I work. So, I, I'm very much a sterile functionary until something inspires me or motivates me or moves me in a certain direction. And um, I, I had been, we had went, the youth and I, uh, the Quinlans had put together a little bit of a camping trip, and I, uh, most of the youth were going, and I, I wanted to go with them, and we had a wonderful time. And it was humbling, I think, maybe Sister Joyce or those that were there. It was so sweet to see. I figured, how many people do you think on a a weekend night, how many kids, you know, 14, 15, 16, 18 years old, would be sitting around a fire with their hands lifted up to God, not just singing songs, but worshiping the Lord? I doubt that there's many in this world. Um, But I was so humbled and I was so thankful. I know Sister Joyce, we were sitting there, we were just almost in tears to see the power of God in this age to hold a young people and give them victorious life and change their own desires uh, to the things of God and not to the things of this world and all that this world could offer them. Yet it's still, this was most important. And it was just interesting. We were sitting around the fire and we were, you know, I was sharing a little bit and the kids were sharing a little bit about... um, you know, seeing God in nature and seeing God in the things that are around us, you know. And Brother Branham said, if you're looking for him, you can see him in anything, right? And I've noticed that. And many times God will take me through something and it'll bring my focus to something. And uh, he, God has a purpose in doing that. And uh, usually it's timely. And it just so happened that the last day of that event, um, we, some young guys and I felt the challenge to do a zipline obstacle course. Sounds strange, but it was pretty fun. The kids all know about it. And if you have moms and dads with kids that were there, you probably heard all about it. Some of the young guys and myself wanted to, to give this a shot. And it just was interesting to me. We, we did this entire obstacle course, and as we were driving home, the kids fell asleep. They were wore out, and I started thinking about this obstacle course and getting through this obstacle course. And as I was sitting there, inspiration started striking me. And I know you're thinking like, yeah, right. I mean, a man-made zipline obstacle course. Brother Branham caught inspiration from a pack of cigarettes, a thinking man's filter. So just in case you're thinking God couldn't speak to you through that, God can speak through anything if he wants to. (laughs) And as I was driving back, I started, I can tell when inspiration is striking me. And I started rehearsing what just happened. What did I just go through? Why did I not do it the way I wanted to? Why didn't I seem to have the victory I wanted to in accomplishing this obstacle course? And then I started thinking about things. This obstacle course, can I describe it for you? This obstacle course is um, it's in four stages. There's an intermediate, a beginning, an advanced, and a professional stage. And with every um, level, you go higher. And at the highest level, you're 40, 50 something feet up in the air. And each obstacle has eight to 10 different obstacles on each run of these obstacles, okay? And so we're looking at this and it's a little nerve wracking. I don't like heights a lot, but it looked fun and wanted to do it. And I don't want to be embarrassed in front of a whole bunch of kids, right? They're loving to embarrass me if they could. And um, so we we do this and, and, and we commit to this and me and about 10 other, 12 other young men. 
And the first thing that happens is obviously they suit you up. And I'm thinking, okay, the instructor is like, I'm going to give you some instructions on how to go through this course. Okay, wonderful. So we, we all line up, the men that were there, and we get ready. We're all harnessed up. And he's, he's like, okay, now gather around here. We're going to tell you how this works. I'm like, awesome. He's going to show me how to accomplish and navigate every aspect of these obstacles. Right? That's what everybody would think. He doesn't. The entire instruction, he takes you to the cord, the zip line. And he says, let me tell you about this cord. This cord is 16 strand of steel. This cord can hold 16,000 pounds. This cord can pick up a bus. And he goes on and on and on about the strength of this cord. Then he goes, this thing, this locking mechanism, it's Swiss made. Apparently Swiss make good stuff. So it's Swiss made and it can't break. These things are tested twice, you know, whatever testing would need to be done. And when you lock this in to this strand, you're not going anywhere. So you have nothing to be afraid of. And that's it. Have fun, everybody. No more instruction. No more detailing, how am I going to overcome this obstacle and this obstacle? And what about this one? And what about that one? They felt no need to tell you any other information than the cord won't break. It's a solid cord. You can put your full faith and confidence and trust in it. And you're anchored to that cord with this Swiss-made lock system. Pretty easy to see the type and why I might have caught inspiration from that. What was more interesting of that, me being the prideful individual that I am, I did not want to rely upon holding on to this cord. I wanted to do this entire obstacle course in my own strength. And I got about halfway through the obstacle course, and I'm up there, and I think Stephen Binkley and um, the Brooks, uh, was it Jonathan Brooks? No. James Brooks is right up there with me. I'm sweating. They have pictures of this. I'm going to die. My hands are shaking, you know, and I'm wore out. And they're smiling, just having a good time. And I'm like, well, how in the world are these young fellas up here with me? I mean, I'm a little bit stronger than them. But you know what I realized? I stopped and just started watching them. They'd get to an obstacle, and you have to go from, like, ropes. I mean, it's physically challenging. And I watched them, and they wouldn't even, they'd just see the obstacle. They'd try for a second, like, nah, hold on to their rope, zip line across to the other side. And they were able to even overcome me in this. But why? They had full faith and confidence without fear that what they were anchored to could take them to the other side. And I found myself wore out mess because I'm trying to still do everything in my own strength. And it learned a, I learned a huge lesson in this. There's a reason why we get so wore out. You forgot the lifeline. You forgot that he's the overcomer. And if he's in you, That's all you're relying upon. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. And it was just so interesting to me. So if it's okay, this kind of lays the background of the thought, and then we'll just keep going. Because there was one other aspect when we were all done that I got to realize. I went up to the men at the end, and I said, man, that was really, really hard. And he goes, yeah, this was one of the instructors. I said, there was a couple of spaces in there I, I couldn't accomplish. I, could, I couldn't do it in my own strength. He said, it's designed like that. He said, it's made like that. When you get up to those advanced and pro levels, you think you can overcome it. You think that you can actually navigate it. It's actually designed. You can't. So the only way you can get from point A to point B and get through that portion of the course, you have to trust in the zip line, and you literally have to use that obstacle to pull you across to the other side. So see, you can catch inspiration. If God's showing you something, you can catch it from anything. So out of that, it inspired me with something because it's been a, how many have been going through some battles, right? It seems like the intensity of things is getting a little bit more intense, but it has to get more intense. What if I told you it's the very obstacles and their intensity of the obstacles that are there to ordain you to bring you to another side of something else? You believe that? We keep complaining about the obstacle. We keep complaining about the situation. What if that's the God-foreordained situation and trial to get you to where you need to be? 
Then you stop complaining. You stop saying, Lord, remove this obstacle. You say, God, thank you for the obstacle. This is the thing I needed to get me from where I am to where you are. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. So I titled this little thought, The Overcomer's Pathway to the Throne. And if you turn to 1 John 5, 1. We're going to look at this overcomer. Say amen when you're there. It says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begatteth loveth him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God. When we love God and keep his commandments. Now, remember this, next verse. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is, not was, not will be. He is the present tense. I am the living word. This is the one that will overcome. And if you look at this word overcome, Greek word, nikio, simple, to conquer, to gain the victory over. It says of Christians that hold fast their faith even unto death against the powers of their foes, temptations, and persecutions. You see, we all want him to receive the glory that he deserves. But the only way he can receive the glory that he deserves in you is you have to overcome everything that can be thrown at you. You see, in en when we took that thought on Enoch, remember in Enoch's seven seal mystery secret of Enoch's journey home, when I started looking at that, and Brother Benham said this is a perfect type of the bride, right? There was a Satan's Eden in that day when Enoch was alive. You see, Cain had went forth and had dedicated to himself to bringing forth this city that was every desire human being would want. And he names this city Enoch. So Enoch had to overcome Enoch Amen. in order to take the body change, right? Amen. Abraham, there had to be a Sodom and Gomorrah there for Abraham to have a body change. If you follow this pattern, it's in that land in that day of, of, of Satan's Eden that is actually the catalyst that brings the body change. Amen. It has to be that way. It's always been that way. And every type in the Bible will show it to be the truth. It had to take a Daniel who could stand, withstand. He was, he was of favored, favored with God, which gave him favor with men. He exalted into a position where everybody looked at him and admired the position. But there rose up a jealousy for this one who had favor with God. And what did they go to do? To kill him. Their purpose next was, I'm going to destroy this vessel who has got favor with God and favor with men. But the very thing was, in that anti-Christ world, that anti-Christ city of Babylon, anti-word anti city of Babylon, Daniel overcame it. And so much so did he overcame it and lived uncompromising, even to, if you throw me in the lion's den, it won't matter, that the very physical nature of those lions could not overcome what was in Daniel. Amen. Something was on the inside of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so much so that fire, this natural fire, something changed their being, so much so that the elements of fire had no more effect on them. Are you telling me these are things that we can achieve in this natural body? I believe we can. I believe we're already being raptured, we're already being changed, we're already coming into a position where we're showing that this word is not subject to the elements of this world any longer. He's already come. And if he's came and he's overcome, now he's calling his bride to take her rightful position upon the throne where she's ordained to come to. And that's exactly what's coming. That's exactly what's going on. But the only way you're coming there is your overcomer. Amen. You are overcoming whatever is thrown at you. I don't care what the obstacle is. I don't care if your wife leaves you. I don't care if your, your children walk away from this message. I don't care if you lose your job. I don't care if everybody in this church makes fun of you. You're an overcomer. It doesn't no longer matter. You have no more excuses why you won't serve God. You have no excuses not to come to communion. You have no excuses not to come to foot washing. 
Sorry, I heard Brother Ben's Wednesday night service, the five first five minutes, no more excuses. But you have no more excuses. Are you testifying when you can't come to communion, you can't come to foot washing, that greater is in the world than greater than he that's in you? Because that's what you're testifying to. You let some situation, you let some obstacle to cause you to let loose, let loose of the very anchoring faith that kept you and called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Why would you testify of anything else rather than he's still the overcomer because he's still in me. And if I fall, that's all right. I'll grab quickly to the lifeline and I'll get right back up and I'm gonna keep on marching for his glory, not mine. That's what this whole thing is about, his glory, not your comfort. Not nobody hurts my feelings. It's nonsense. What do you think this message was here to do? Make you feel good? Give you a comfortable ride? No. No, it's not. It's to produce a bride just like him. And this word is going to produce a bride that's just like him without spot or wrinkle. And she'll overcome anything you throw at her. She's an overcomer. She's born to overcome. Brother Branham says in uh, How Can I Overcome? He says, Daniel, the man, the prophet, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, was a, uh, and Daniel was a prophet. And that was the size of the church in that day. I mean the bride. There's lots of church. Two million of them came, uh, went down there. But there was just, just the size of the overcomer. Them overcomers was put to the test. And every overcomer has to be put to the test. When they said, you take back what the word says, or either we'll throw you into the fiery furnace, they refused anything but the word. You've got to be tested. You're not going to sit on that throne with him because you repented. You're not going to sit on that throne because you worship. You're going to sit on that throne because you overcame by the blood of the lamb, the word of his testimony, and you love not your lives unto death. That's how you're going to overcome. And that's the only ones that sit on that throne with him. How many want to sit on the throne with him? Okay, so you have to overcome. Guess what? Tests are coming to see if you can overcome. Not your strength, just to see what your faith is going to do at that point. Is your faith going to be in your own strengths? Your faith going to be in that uncompromising, never failing words of God? That's going to be the test. And we all have them. If you remember in Mark, <clears throat> uh, the mother of James and John had come to Jesus and they wanted to sit on uh, he wanted his sons to sit one on his right hand and one on his left. And look at how Jesus responds to this. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came unto him saying, Master, we would that thou wouldest do something, do, shouldest do for us whatsoever we desire. And he said unto them, What would you that I should do for you? And they said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on the right hand and one on the left, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? Think of that. We're going to come back to that. And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And they said unto him, we can. And Jesus said unto him, ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of. And with the baptism that I am baptized with uh, shall, shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. This place is a prepared place for only the, over the, the overcomers. It's not given to you just because you ask, but one thing you will find is the pattern never changes. If he overcame and had to drink of that cup in the garden of Gethsemane, where he says, Father, not my will be done, but thine will be done, you're drinking of that same cup. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. First thing he wants to remind you of when you go to pray, this has nothing to do with your will anymore. That's where we get in the way and that's where we have our problems and that's when everything seems to go awry in my life and in your life. When you start to seek out your own will and your own purposes and you want to do what you want to do. Why are you here? Why do you have breath? You could be dead. I know lots of people that haven't even lived to as old as me. I was talking to my daughter the other day. Honey, why do you have life? Why do we have life? He gave us a gift. He gave us a gift. I have this honor. Not only did he give me life, he revealed himself to me. And then not only that, I know I'm his. And not only that, I know I'm born to overcome. I know that he's with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. 
I have this revelation, and most of the world doesn't have it, and I'm standing upon that. And then I want to spend all my time and energy the rest of my life to do what I want to do. Sounds very strange. This doesn't sound like the bride that's going to drink of the same cup that he drinks from. <clears throat> Next portion. And this took me back when I saw it. Oh, sorry. But the Branham says in the Lady of Sin Church Age, Now then, there will not be one person who will sit in the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ unless he has been living that word. Your prayers, your fastings, and your repentances, no matter what you present to God, none of that will gain you the privilege of sitting in that throne. It will be granted only to a word bride. What's your excuse? Why can't you fully submit to the word? How many want to be an overcomer? How many want to sit on that throne? Are you living, are you the living word? Is there anything in your life right now you know I'm not the living word? I don't come to communion. I don't come to foot washing. You know when they make a dirty joke at, at work, I laugh at it. I'm afraid to really take a stand for this word. I'm afraid I'll lose my wife. I'm afraid to really stand for this word. I'm afraid my kids are going to walk away from me. I find myself, I'm always compromising for somebody or something because my natural human love has moved me away from the word. But to love God is to keep his commandments, period. And that's the only thing. Because he set himself apart and endured the cross, therefore he could save others. And you're not going to do any good for anybody compromising ever in your life. Might as well be hot and on fire standing for this word. That's the only thing that could have an, in any type of uh, impact in somebody's life at this point. But now's the time for really what Brother Ben said, no more excuses. Stop it. It's too late. Stop testifying to this world that this word, world has a stronger pull or hold on you than the word of God. Only those who are of that word, even as he is of that word, will share that throne. And just for the sake of pulling back to show you some of those obstacles, that was that obstacle course. And tons and tons of obstacles. But it really didn't matter, did it? The obstacles don't matter. The obstacles aren't the question. And how to navigate each and individual obstacle is never the question. It's do you actually have faith that what, what God gave you, you're anchored to? And do you have actual faith to overcome it? Every obstacle. You know, I'm thinking about this word that he's given us, a, pure, a, a sure assurance that it's never failed. It's never broken down. Just as this line, when you had faith and confidence in that line, you could Remove all fear. No more doubt could come into your mind. Will it hold me or won't it hold me? If you had a pure faith that that line was going to hold you, you could venture into anything. It didn't matter. But when fear comes in, it replaces your faith. And then you start to doubt that word. You actually do. You may not think you do. You may actually say, I don't doubt the word. But your actions are testifying something differently. Your actions aren't speaking what you're saying. You say, I believe this word. It's God's revealed word. It's the thing that I need to overcome in this age. And yet you don't hold on to it. Your faith doesn't anchor to it. You try to navigate it in your own strength. And the thing that Brother Branham said in the odd body, he said, now it won't thread, let me get to it. It won't thread up with the denomination. This is your faith. It'll only thread with the word. But there is some people in the world believes that word. It'll take a nut to wrap that bride out of here. It's threaded. For the bride and bridegroom are one, and God is one, and the word is God. Amen. It'll have to be threaded with the word, and it will draw the bride out of these denominations. Trials and tribulations, situations, I don't care what it is, it'll draw you right up through it. A couple of these pictures, I know it's a little bit out of order, but just so you can show you some of the certain obstacles 
And it's just interesting, with every obstacle, you got more and more tired. You got more and more wore out, physically spent, nothing to give, at least for these two guys. Then you have the happy-go-lucky smile on his face, breaking no sweat at all, Jack Sanders. <laughs> Smiling as he's navigating this portion of the course, Gabriel. Literally laughing as he's navigating this portion of the course, Riley Sanders. And then dum-dum. <laughs> Trying to do everything in my own strength. Arms out. You notice I'm not, I'm not holding tightly to the cord I'm anchored to. Everybody else, they're taking a sure hand of faith grip on that line. That's their safety line. That's their anchor. And it's helping them to get from one side to the other. But not me. I'm convinced I'm older than these guys. I'm twice their size. I've been around longer. I can do this. And that's why I almost threw up at the very top of this course. And my arms were shaking so unbelievably bad it was embarrassing. And I tried not to show it. But you learn a valuable lesson. It's not him that willeth, nor him that runneth. We are all going through a difficult situation because you have a very worthy opponent called the devil, who is an archangel created co-equal to God, literally working day and night to get you to move from the word, just to get you to let go, just to convince you in your own strength, never work, never work. Brother Branham says, in perfect strength, through perfect weakness. I've often said the greatest enemy I got is William Branham. Greatest enemy I got, Kai Weikert. Right? Josh, greatest enemy you got. Brother Tommy, greatest enemy you got. Brother Tommy. Devil's not your greatest enemy. You, your greatest enemy. He's the one that gets in God's way. He's the one that gets lazy. He's the one that gets to a place sometimes where he thinks he can do something about it. And when he does, that shoves God right out of the picture. And you know what? You're going to fall. You let go of that lifeline, you're going to fall. Tell you what's so fun about this, though. As a predestinated son of God, you can only fall so far. There was an anchor point. I could fall two feet, but I ain't going any farther than that. Because predestinated grace, I'm his. I'll always be his. I never made myself a son. I can't keep myself a son. There's nothing that can separate me from a son. But I want to overcome for him. But when I get rid of that guy, when I can get to a place that he is out of the way, then God can come over and do things that William Branham knows nothing about. He can do things that Kyle Weikert knows nothing about when he gets out of the way. Then when God can use you, that's when God can use you. That's when he can use any of you. He can use anybody when you get out of the way. I think we have a lot of getting out of our own way, don't you? I do. I still do. By God's grace, serving him now eight, nine years, and you know what I find out? I'm in the way all the time. What's wrong with Kyle Weikert? He needs to die a little bit more. I'm thankful for this little obstacle course that showed me my strength is not going to be the thing that overcomes in this age. It's his strength. It's what he's done for me that's going to take me through. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. His might, not yours. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in that evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand. This day is a very, very evil day. I was talking to a brother the other day. I said, think about this, brother. The entire world that you're walking in right now is designed with one purpose in mind, to get the bride to fall. Everything around you. I mean, think of the great expense and the great effort put into just trying to get the bride to compromise on the word. If she can just 
stay in a compromised condition and not fully possess the land and not fully take all that is hers given to her by the great overcomer and not take a body change, he can stay in his position. But when she moves into a position where she's fully overcome and she sits and takes her full place of dominion on that throne with him and death has lost its hold, he's cast down and he knows he has but a short time from that point on. So thinking of it, everything in your entire life is custom made to get you to fall. Everything. But it doesn't matter. You can't fall if you're holding on to him, or I should say he's holding on to you, and you're by faith is holding tightly on to that word because that will never, ever fail. And it's interesting, too, I wanted to take a thought here with David. You know, David was on a pathway to the throne as well. He was born to overcome literally born to overcome and was destined to come to the throne of full dominion and uh, authority in the kingdom. But David had to overcome first a bear, had to overcome then a lion, and then overcame a Philistine, an 11-foot Goliath, right? But how did he overcome these things? He's just a little fella. He'd had no confidence in his own human strength anymore. Something that God taught him from an early stage on was you better just rely on me because you're never in your own strength going to overcome a bear, never going to overcome a lion, and you're especially not going to overcome an 11-foot Goliath. But when the time he got to the Goliath in that showdown, he was so fully convinced that God's covenant was with him that there was absolutely nothing that could defeat him. He was so convinced that that word that says you're coming to the throne, he was an invincible man. And this bride becomes an invincible army because she fully faithfully trusts the Lord and his word and lost all confidence in her strength. And you look at those three stages of, of his overcoming, he comes to the great showdown. But there was a fourth stage in David's life. It came to a point where David couldn't overcome David. David became his own enemy. When that time when the kings go to battle, he was not in his rightful position doing the things he was supposed to have been doing at the time when he was supposed to be doing them. He got lazy. He was lounging around in his own home, not about the father's business, not doing what God called you to do, and then David became his own enemy. Then he, it's absolute truth. That fourth stage got him. Jesus overcame in the wilderness the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three stages, he was victorious. But there was a fourth overcoming too. He had to overcome himself. Show it to you. Brother Bam says in Laodicean Church, in his own personal life, contending with himself, he overcame by obedience to the word of God. See, you so many times think, well, I'm, I'm getting the victory, I'm overcoming, I'm overcoming everything that Satan can send me. But have you overcome yourself yet? Have you overcome your own will? Have you actually laid aside your will for his will? Is this the question? This is the last aspect of the overcomer, and you have to overcome this portion right here to sit on that throne. Hebrews 5, 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears, unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. I was learning obedience to have faith in God's word through those obstacles and wearing myself out. And so will the bride of Jesus Christ. He'll let you wear yourself out. He'll let you just go around in circles, going nowhere, until finally you'll wake up and realize, by God's grace, this isn't what I'm born for. This isn't what I'm on this earth for. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him. What was he obedient to? The word of God. So, Brother Branham says in the Laodicean church age, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and sat down on my father's throne. Now, here's the thing. Now, what are we to overcome? That is the normal question we ask here, but that is not the actual thought of the verse. For it's not so much what we are to overcome but how we are to overcome. So Brother Branham just very clearly states right here, it doesn't matter what the obstacle anymore. It doesn't. 
You can name whatever one you want to. It doesn't matter. We don't need to do a five-part series on how to have a better home. We don't need to have a five-part series on how to receive your healing. We don't need those things. It doesn't matter what the obstacle is anymore, guys. We have the master key. He gave us the master key to unlock every door of every promise that he ever gave us, and it's faith in God's word. All you have to do is take a hold of the key and unlock the promise. But it's only to the one that has faith in the promise. That's the only one the key works for. So, now this is logical. Uh, sorry, let me back this up. But that is not the actual thought of the verse, for it is not so much what we are to overcome, but how we are to overcome. Now, this is logical for what does it matter much what we are to overcome as long as we know how we can overcome. A quick look at the scriptures will involve Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus overcoming, will bring this truth of the proposition. In Matthew 4, wherein Jesus is tempted of the devil, he overcame the personal temptations of Satan by the word and by the word only. In each of the three major trials that corresponded exactly to the temptation of the Garden of Eden, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, Jesus overcame by the word, and Eve fell to the personal temptations of Satan by failing to use the word. Adam fell in direct disobedience to the word, but Jesus overcame by the word. And right now, let me say this, say that this is the only way to be an overcomer. Also, it is the only way that you can know if you're overcoming. Let me read that again. The only way you can know that you're actually overcoming. The right, and right now, let me say this, the only, that was the only way to be an overcomer. Also, it's the only way that you can know if you're own overcoming because the word can't fail. If you find yourself in compromise to the word, you're not overcoming. You're not the overcomer you think you are. You're just not. This is the only way you know that you're overcoming. I don't care if you don't cut your hair, you wear a dress every day and you come to church every service. If out Monday through Friday you can't take a stand for the word, you're not overcoming. You're not an overcomer. You've missed something along the way. You came out like the two million that came out, they sure looked like overcomers, but when they were tested, they showed their colors. Not mixing the word with faith, right? That was the biggest problem of all. Brother Brandon and How Can I Overcome actually goes to Lot's wife and says it looked like Lot's wife was an overcomer for a moment. But her desire was still inside of her for the things of Sodom. And she took that long last look at the things she truly loved. And it proved right there she wasn't an overcomer. Though it looked like she was, she had a good start. But when the testing time came, she showed her colors. And the testing time is going to come for all of us to see if we're truly an overcomer. The band says in the rising of the sun. Now look, how can you say that the spirit dwells in you, though you've done everything that you thought was right? Here is the evidence on whether you got it or not. If the spirit that was in Christ is in you, it also quickens you to the word, for he is the word. And if it contrary quickens you away from the word, then it isn't the spirit of Christ. Care what you do until that moves you in the word. Amen? It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you look like. If the spirit inside of you isn't confirming and saying amen to the word with the life that you're manifesting, then something else has gotten a hold of you and it's taking you away from the word. You're not an overcomer. You've been defeated. You've been separated from the very thing you're born to do was to overcome. Sorry, it's getting quiet on me. Everybody's awake, right? Sorry, maybe too much reading, but these things are life to us. These things mean more to me than anything, and I want to be found faithful saying what he said because I believe it. Now then, there will not be one person who will sit on that throne of the Lord Jesus Christ unless he has been living that word. That's in there twice, so it must be good. By accident, I put it in there. Your fastings, your prayers, and your repentance, no matter, uh, no matter what you present to God, none of that will gain you the privilege of sitting on that throne, only granted to the word bride. Maybe the Lord wanted us to see that again. Amen. I believe there's accidents. So in Hebrews... We know that the heroes of faith of chapter 12, he says, now laying aside every weight and every sin that does so easily beset us, let us run with patience. 
Now, he didn't say, let us run a sprint. He said, with patience. It's a patient running. Sounds strange for a guy who likes to sprint. But it's in patience. It's faithful. It's steadfast. It's sure. It's a consistency. It's disciplined as a disciple of Christ. You're disciplined. You're faithfully walking or running the race that's set before you. Not hastily running. You're doing great this week and you fell off next. No, you're faithful, you're steadfast, you're disciplined, and you're true, right? So run the race uh, with patience, the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He looked beyond the pain and saw we'd all be there with him. I'm so glad he did. I'm so glad that he did, and now we get this same opportunity. Despising the shame and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Revelations 12. It's something that I was studying yesterday, and when I came to it, I thought, hmm, this is interesting. It threw me. So I kept looking at it, and then it opened up a little bit more. It says in Revelations 12, verse 5, this is an interesting portion. It says, And she brought forth the man-child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. We know this is Christ. He will rule and reign with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And immediately when he is caught up to the throne and the child's caught up to the throne, we see that the woman, the Hebrews are running for a three and a half year tribulation is set in and he is cast down to persecute those that are left, right? So it looks like Christ ascended and immediately the devil comes down with full fath and rear fury knowing that his time is short when he takes his position on the throne. Now we know the throne isn't like a physical throne like this. It's like, like a seat. It's a place of dominion. It's a place of authority, of absolute authority and dominion. Now if you'll follow this, in the Greek, this man-child is referred to almost a hundred times as a son or a male figure, okay? As a male offspring is a metaphor for this most commonly used. But her child, it's a different word. It's a technon. And this is referring to a woman or a daughter offspring. Also referred to as a, a citizens or a people or inhabitants of a city. And when they take their rightful place on that throne, he's cast down. Because when Brother Branham said, when she goes up, he comes down, that's exactly what takes place. He's on the throne. He overcame. He's seated there. Now I'm overcoming, taking my rightful place on that same throne with him in a place of full dominion because I've overcome everything that you could throw at me by the word and the word alone. And he knows I have but a short time. They've arrived. And this is exactly what's taking place. But you can see here then if you drop this back to verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, saying the right things. And they loved not their lives unto death. 68 million killed through the dark ages. Now you have to die to live for him. You still have to die to live for him. It's never changed. Your will still has to be surrendered to his will. It will never change. You still must drink of that same cup if you want to sit on that same throne with him. Amen. Now, Brother Benham says here, overcome means to recognize the devil in every one of his tricks. Lots of people says there is no devil. It's just a thought. Don't you believe that? There's a real devil. He's just as real to you as anybody, a real devil, and you must recognize him real. You must know he's a devil. Then the same time that you recognize him, you know that he's a devil and he's against you. Then to overcome, you must recognize that the God in you is greater and mightier than he is. That's the one. That's in you has already overcome him. So it's not you overcoming. It's yielding yourself to the one that's already overcome who's living in you. And the devil's no match for him. And he is the word. And by his grace, you are more than a match for him. And this is where it just gets simple and a little bit humbling. 
Now, we're not a perfect people. We make our mistakes. We do things that's wrong. But you see, love recovers all that. We're willing, when we see our mistakes, to come back and apologize one to another. Yeah, that's a real warrior. I want to be a real warrior. I want to say Kyle was too strong, and I failed miserably, but I'm getting back up. That's what it really, that's, that is really men and women that's gallant. Any man that can go out onto the battlefield that's got, that's got nerve enough to walk out there, but when he gets knocked down, then gets back up and tries it again. See, there used to be a song, young man, young woman used to sing, if I fall or if I fail, and he says, let me rise and try again. Real warriors, going to get knocked down. And if you're walking in your own strength, you're going to get knocked down. But by God's grace, you're only going to fall so far. And you're going to grab hold of that lifeline. You're going to pull yourself back up and you're going to keep marching again. Right? Brother Branham goes on to say here, he says, with as many as 100 or 20 people in here, you're bound to find things sometimes the enemy will sweep in among you and through your minds and start this and start that. Just stop when he does and think back. Think back to this morning. Think back to the times where you're sitting together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, when I stop and I think back times like that, I can think of everything that he came on the scene for me. Every time where it was really dark and he came on the scene for me. Every time when I've had a service here when God literally would speak directly to my heart. Those times where you know that the voice of God was speaking to you at that very moment and you no, nothing could be hidden in his sight. I think back on those times, don't you? Things get really weary. Things get really rough. That's moments I think about. I think most often when I'm alone with him, that's where he seems to speak to me the most, that quiet time with him. He says, some of you plumbers, some of you carpenters, some this, some that, and the other, you rub arms with the world each day. When you're out there and when you see those things and those great temptations rise, just remember these little sacred places where you're sitting together. With the only thing that lasts, your jobs will fail. One of these days, your health will fail. Even your life here on earth will fail, but that won't fail. And he, if he is the center of all things, then let's keep our minds on the center post. That has drawn us to us. Amen. That's the thing that I wanted to bring to your attention. I had told Brother Chad, it just felt to me like it was more of a Wednesday night thought, but it had fallen my lot to take a Sunday service. If you don't mind, will you stand with me? I know it was simple, and I told my wife, it's too simple. It's too small of a thought. But you know, Brother Brandon was always shooting for a 30-minute service. <laughs> we went about an hour, so I fulfilled what the, word of God, or what the prophet wanted, his desire, right? How many would you maybe by testifying, I'll be the first to put my hand up. I have failed miserably trying to do this in my own strength. I have failed epically. I really, really have. I mean, humbly and by, with just full, I'm a very transparent person. It seems like, how dumb is Kyle? You started off knowing that it was the grace of God that led you this far. What did hinder you from going all the way? What stopped you in your walk with the Lord? What made you think that this had something to do with your own right. mental prowess or your own human will determination? It's nonsense. God knows how to drop you right to your knees. It's the best place for every one of us to be. You believe it with all your heart? Musicians, if you'll come. I think as the musicians are coming, maybe we should repent. Yeah. And I will be the first to do it. I don't think I have drank of the cup that I'm supposed to drink of. Because that cup is pretty tough. You know, it's so easy in this day where America, life's easy. Lots of things to occupy your time. Lots of things to keep you busy. Thinking you're doing something of some importance when actually it means absolutely nothing and literally you just took the bait and you jumped back on the hamster wheel and you're running a hundred miles an hour and then you wonder why you wonder why you're so wore out wonder why maybe you're not even doing the thing God told you to do and maybe he's allowing some trials and situations to come just to show you you're on the wrong path you're not supposed to be doing this I did not call you for this 
you know? I find it so interesting sometimes that sisters in the message want to continually find their identification in a career and then wonder why things aren't working out. It's contrary to the Word of God. It's not what God called you to do. God called a bride to find her identity in her groom, her complete identity in Him, right? That's why when you see there's only one seated on the throne, He is. And her identity is found in Him completely and utterly. Let's just have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, just surrendering this time in our vessels to you, Father. It's just a simple thought. It's a little, little word. But Lord, if it strikes the right point in someone's heart, if it brings about the right kind of change in their life, then it's met its purpose. Not here to do anything out of emotion, not here to try to motivate anybody with any aspect of an emotional pull, but just with the pure word of God to lay out the word before the people to see how they will respond to it. Lord, you laid it out for me and it struck hard and I realized it was the truth and I had to repent. Recognizing, Lord, I wasn't born to do my will. I'm not here on this earth for this purpose. Neither is this bride here to do her will, but his will. I pray, Lord, that you would help each and every one of us, Lord. Lord, forgive us. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me for spending so much time and energy doing the things that mean nothing to you but meant something to me. It's not why I'm here. Have mercy upon us, Father. Just ask it humbly, Lord. Meet us where we are, Father. You know all about us. I'm so thankful that you're, care you're mindful of us. Scripture says, Lord, that your thoughts towards us are many. You know our entering in and our going out. You know everything about us. Just humbly ask, Lord, that you'd forgive us and forgive me as a people. Lord, we want to be that bride that you are looking for. We want to be just like you and sit on that throne with you, Father. And we know that there has to come these tests. And these are just your mercy, your rods, your corrections to show us what we're on this earth for. Lord, we love you. We commit ourselves afresh and anew to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Brother, you got a song on your heart? Winds of faith. You started up, brother. There are two roads you may take, one by sight and one by faith. Just take the word of God and what you see.